I'm here with uh, Daniel D'Agostino. I hope you are said your name correctly. And we are in API Days Helsinki doing building flexible APIs with O data. And I look forward to hearing from you, Daniel. Let's talk after the uh, presentation a bit more. Yes, Go ahead. Thank, thank you very much. Um, so welcome everyone um, to this session on O data. My name is Daniel D'Agostino. I'm a software team lead at Cleverbit Software. And um, I'm based in Malta. I've been working for more than 10 years in the software industry. And my main focus is uh, development with .NET. I've also been uh, running a number of websites and blogs as far back as 2002, and I also write, uh, write articles professionally. Um, so before we talk about all data, let's first take a quick look at REST. As you already know, REST is very popular nowadays as a way to build APIs. It's built on open standards, and it's a lot better than a lot of technologies we had to work with before. However, REST comes with some of its own challenges. So let's take an example where we need to get the data about a user, as you can see here, together with the user's posts and followers. In order to do that, a lot of the time with REST, we need to first retrieve the data of the user and then retrieve that user's posts and then retrieve the followers. So that's three requests just to get some data that is actually related. And this is something called underfetching. So since the endpoint is not that rich, uh, sometimes it takes multiple requests to get the data we actually need. And uh, there is also the opposite problem. So if someone were to build an endpoint that contained all that information, then perhaps some of the clients would only need a subset of it. Let's say you might only need a couple of fields, whereas the endpoint gives you 15. So in that case, as you can imagine, there is a bit of waste. So um, as you can see, when you have a lot of different clients for your API, this can be a bit problematic. So if we have APIs which internal clients are consuming, then Perhaps different clients have different needs, and some of them need a different set of data. Um, when we're dealing with external clients, it's, it's the same problem, but we have actually less control. And it's not that easy to determine or to figure out beforehand what those clients will actually need. And finally, we also need to think about browsers at the edge. So for example, your mobile phone uh, has less resources than your laptop, so um, potentially it, it might benefit it to request less data than, than your normal web application on the laptop would. So keeping all this in mind, wouldn't it be nice if we could query our APIs using something a bit like SQL for APIs? And the answer is that that technology already exists. So one of the most popular ways of doing it nowadays is use GraphQL. And in GraphQL, what you do is you formulate a query containing the data you actually want to retrieve. So let's say I want this user with a specific ID, and I want the name of that user and also some related data. So I want the posts, but just the title. I don't want everything from those posts. And similar for the followers. And what's nice about this is that the data we get back uh, is quite similar in structure to the query we requested. There is this nice symmetry. Um, what's a little bit weird with this is that uh, most of the time you end up having to use an HTTP post um, uh, you know, for a retrieval operation, which is a little bit strange. So GraphQL is not the only way to do this, and certainly not the first. Um, so OData, which stands for the Open Data Protocol, has existed long before. And OData is described by the OData website as an open protocol to allow the creation and consumption of queryable and interoperable RESTful APIs in a simple and standard way. So the key takeaway of this is queryable, 
Okay. Um, our data was started by Microsoft in 2007, and after a number of years, it was opened up into an open standard. And the biggest wins of our data are around how easy it is to uh, integrate an API with a data source. A lot of the time, it's a relational database, but it could also be something else. So what it does is it gives us a layer between our API and the data source with uh, very little effort. And even though a lot of the time our data might be mentally associated with Microsoft, as a matter of fact, um, there are a number of libraries for other technologies as well. In fact, if we switch over to the OData website and to go to the libraries page, apart from .NET here, you can also see signs for Java, and for JavaScript, and a lot of other technologies as well. So the way OData works is that it builds this thing called an entity data model, which describes the structure of the data we're exposing, essentially the structure of data in the data source. And then what it does is it maps that data source to the OData engine. So that is the part that receives and processes the requests. It, with OData, we also get a service document, which lists top level entity collections, and the metadata document, which is a representation of the entity data model. Finally, an OData API is built out of REST endpoints. It's the usual GET and POST and so on. However, OData also gives us a number of query conventions that we can use to uh, uh, query against our API. And in fact, I'm going to show you a quick demo. So the first demo I have here is a very trivial one. So all we're doing is we have a get endpoint here, and we're creating 200 instances of this person class, which is simply an ID and a name. It's simple as that. And if we head on over to the OData endpoint now, we can see the service document. This gives us the top level entities. We have people, we have countries, and we have cities. We'll look at the last two later. And we'll also see that we have a link to the metadata document. So we can see how, let's say for a person, we have an ID, which is an integer, and the name, which is a string. And then we have other entities, which we'll take a look at later. So since we have people here, we can simply append it at the end of the URI, and we get our 200 people. Let's zoom in a bit there. And at this point, we can start to run some queries. In fact, I have a few ready here that I'm going to show you. So the easiest thing to do is to select particular fields. Let's say we only want to show the name. So we simply append that select at the end, and we get each entity with just the name. We can also filter, which is a bit like an SQL where clause. So here we're asking for the people with the, the name equal to person 56. And that gives us one, one person back. They might have noticed that we have to use the syntax for equals since uh, the equal sign is already being used here. And there are similar conventions for things like greater than and less than, for instance. So let's take an example with a greater than here. ID is greater than 195. And we can also use string functions. So here we want the people whose name ends with five. And we get person five, person 15, and so on. We can also use uh, Boolean expressions to, to combine these conditions over here. We're using an or, let's say. Okay, so, so you can see that the query I'm using here is more or less readable, but once it gets in the browser, it becomes URI encoded, and it's a little bit more difficult. That's one of the small advantages of our, small disadvantages of our data. Um, one of the biggest advantages, however, is that pagination is out of the box pretty much. 
So I can use this top clause to request the top n items from this collection. So if I run this, we're actually going to see an error. And that's because of a security feature in our data. So we can actually configure a limit of how much data they, they can request with top. So in order to have this working, we must request not more than 20 items at a time. Now, along with this top here, I can actually add skip, which means give me 20 items back in this case and skip zero. So that's the same output as we had before. But once I start to change this, say 20, that starts to move up in the pages. So this is the second page, let's say, and this is the third page, for example. Now, one thing you might be asking yourselves is, how do I know when to stop? And the answer is that you can use the count clause. So once you use the count clause, you get this handy overall counter here. And if you combine that with pagination, say like this, we get the third page, but we know that in total there are 200. So that gives us a way of navigating the pages. Finally, you can also use an order by, this is all the people, order by ID ascending, and you can also do it descending. So that's very easy, as you can see. So even though this demo was a really trivial example, you can already start to appreciate that, first of all, something as common as pagination is pretty much out of the box. You don't have to write any code for it. It's also really easy to expose a data source from an API. The boilerplate is absolutely minimal. We also get that flexibility that we were talking about before, where clients get only what they need, no more, no less, just like with GraphQL. And also, since it's a layer on top of REST, all the advantages that are part of REST apply to our data as well. Let's take a look at a slightly more advanced demo and look at some more advanced capabilities. So if we go back to our root endpoint here, oops, let's just go to our data here. And if you remember, we had these countries and cities. We can look at the metadata document once again and see that country is described here. So we have things like an ID, a name, but we also have related entities like this capital city and this collection of cities. And from the city entity, it's similar. It has its own properties, but it also links back to the country. So let's start by looking at the countries and run some queries over there. So one of the most basic things I'm going to do here is to simply request a country by ID. You can see that ID2 is Austria. So just by putting a two in brackets, we're requesting a specific ID. You'll remember that we can actually do this with filter as well, but ID is a first class citizen, so you can do it in this more concise way as well. So while you are on a particular ID, you can still use other clauses, just like select, like we did before. Now, you'll, you might remember from the metadata document that, you know, when, when we're looking at this data, we're actually not seeing the related entities. We should have cities in here as well. And all data doesn't give you those by default. You, you need to ask for them. So all you need to do is use this expand clause here. So like this, we get the capital city, let's say, and see it over here. And if you want the cities as well, it's, it's another field. You can add that as part of the clause. So we have our cities and we have our capital city as well. So we can actually do a lot of this backwards as well, starting from cities. So here we have all the cities, the Irish ones, the Austrian ones, and the German ones. And we can do filtering. Let's say we only want the, the Irish and the German ones. So that's 
uh, a similar filter query as we did before here. And we can do an order by population, let's say. So this will give us the biggest cities. We know that Berlin is the biggest from our data set. Um, if we want to include the country with the city, we can use expand like we did before. And now we have the country as well. And even with this expanded, we can continue to do things like filter operations. So this will give us the cities with a population of less than half a million with the country still uh, available as part of the result. Okay. Um, and interesting you can do here, as, as you can see in this part, is that you can filter based on properties of the related entity. Let's say I want to go into this country and filter by the name. I'll use a string function contains and look for Ireland. And if I do that here, okay, I, I get just the cities that are in Ireland. Finally, um, you can also do some advanced aggregations like this one here, which I will run first and then explain. So basically a country, at the country level, we don't have the population, right? The population is part of the cities, but by using an aggregation over the cities, okay, so here we can see that we're creating the cities themselves and we are doing a sum of the population of each city, which we're then calling total population, which you can see here. So by grouping by the country name, we apply that sum to each country and we end up with this very handy result. Okay. So, so just, just a few notes about some of the practical aspects of working with OData. First of all, documentation. As we've seen, OData gives us service and metadata documents to help with discoverability. However, it, it's not very human friendly and it, it's a bit clumsy as the data set grows. It is possible to get swagger into the picture, but uh, sometimes all data doesn't play very well with it and um, it's, it's not that great with exposing what your API can do. I feel that GraphQL is a little bit better in this area, especially some of the tools that come with GraphQL, the discoverability experience there is really great. So uh, we mentioned how one of the advantages of OData is that you can easily integrate an API with a data source. That's also a disadvantage in itself because in doing so, you are coupling the two together. And that's fine if, if you're doing this for internal APIs where you have control over the client as much as the API. But if you're opening this up to external clients, you need to think a little bit harder about your backwards compatibility and versioning strategies. In terms of community, GraphQL picked up a lot in recent years. It's very popular, everyone's writing about it. OData is a little bit more obscure. Um, so sometimes it, it's a little bit harder to, to find material about OData. In terms of syntax, obviously, OData and GraphQL are quite different. OData uses its own syntax in the URL, whereas GraphQL tends to use the post body. Uh, there are trade-offs for both, and I'd say it's not a big deal, mostly a matter of taste. And finally, um, you know, with great power comes great responsibility, of course, as they say, and uh, we're uh, opening up our APIs and providing a lot of flexibility, but these could potentially be abused, both in OData and in GraphQL. So there are things you can do to um, restrict what people can do with your API. And this depends on the particular implementation. So I advise you to uh, look this up in the documentation and read up on the guidelines. Great, so if you want to learn more about OData, uh, you can check out the official OData homepage, which has some good tutorials and also service endpoints you can play with. If you're using one of the Microsoft endpoints, uh, sorry, one of the Microsoft implementations, 
please check out also the uh, Microsoft Go Data blog, especially good for ASP.NET Core implementations. And if you want to know a bit more about the history, uh, check out the Wikipedia page. So that's all I had. Um, thanks for watching. And thanks. that's it. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Uh, it was really interesting presentation and, and uh, a, a good comparison to GraphQL, for example. I would, I would have actually asked about that if you hadn't brought it to the presentation, but uh, what would you say uh, about the user, like use cases of OData versus, for example, REST APIs done in another way or GraphQL? So is it good just for fetching data or is it good for also like updates and creates and everything else? And, and also about the API management used with all data APIs. Do you have any? Uh, yes, so, so basically <laughs> you, you can use it for retrieving information, for updating. It's, it's basically REST, you know, with, with a layer on top of it for, mm. for um, more advanced querying. Um, uh, it's very useful, especially if you're doing, you know, a lot of internal APIs that do a lot of the same thing. You need to, you know, think of, Things like pagination and how are you going to return your different entity sets so it gives you a lot of flexibility there that your clients can then leverage depending on their differing needs yeah and what about using uh all data with api management tools because if if swagger is not kind of a uh, necessarily a thing that you would need or was it how, how would you use it like would you put for example azure's api management on top of it or or like how do you secure it how do you document it how do you put rate limits on it right so uh, i haven't looked into a lot of those in detail um hmm. i i would say that you can still work with all data in the sense that you know these API uh, management utilities a lot of the time will, uh, you know, wrap on top of the functionality you are exposing. Mm -hmm. So in that case, probably what, what you can do is just um, map those onto your OData endpoints. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't used with OData too, everything else, but not OData because there's like that uh, tie-in a lot of times with Microsoft and Salesforce and a, a few other platforms who kind of like you use their APIs which are all data and they kind of take care of that side of of mm -hmm. things but um good thank you i think we've covered a lot of ground with this talk and it was a pleasure to have you here in virtual helsinki mm -hmm. um so let's let's see you in the live chat session thank bye. you very much no problem bye bye